I'm sure you can probably imagine the ultimate travel nightmare. You book some destination in a far-flung location, and you get to where you're going after a long flight, and you arrive at the hotel, and there's no reservation, and everything's so solid, there's nowhere to stay. Oh, I just, I don't even want to think about it. But in a sense, in an ancient sort of equivalent, that's what happens to Mary and Joseph when they go to Bethlehem. I'm, I'm sure if it happened to you, you'd be upset with your travel agent or Expedia or your husband if you forgot to hit the final reserve button on the, the online reservation. But when it happens to Mary and Joseph, it would be kind of almost reasonable for them to feel angry at God given their situation. But that's sort of missing the point. Let's look at the story here this morning and see what we can come up with here. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Corvinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest for him available for him. Just a quick note on the Greek here. Your translation may say there was no room for them in the inn, or there was no guest room available. The word in Greek is the same. And so people aren't really sure. It could be that Joseph went to Bethlehem and went to a commercial establishment that does hospitality and there wasn't any space for him. Those kind of things were fairly rare, so many scholars believe that it, he actually would have gone to a house of a relative. Bethlehem is, after all, his hometown. But in the way that those houses were constructed, there's a level above and then there's a level below. The people live on the top level. And the bottom level is where they store their animals. It keeps them warm. It also keeps their animals from getting stolen. And it could be that Mary and Joseph's relatives have come to that house and filled it up, and then coming from a great distance, they're the last to arrive. And so when they get there, there's no space for them to, to be in. So they end up in the lower level with the animals, because that's the only space that's available for them to have their baby. Either way, they arrive in Bethlehem, and no one has made any space for them. Now, Mary and Joseph might be understandably on edge. They're paying a huge price socially for being obedient to God's plan. Mary is presumed to be unvirtuous, and Joseph is considered to either be unvirtuous or being duped. They are now at the center of a scandal, and they've had to travel at the most inopportune time and here it is time for them to have the baby and to add insult to injury. There's not even a proper place for them to have the baby. They might feel like, God, why do you keep making this so hard for us? But the truth is, it's nothing to do with them. It's all about Jesus. What kind of Savior will he be? To whom is he going to be accessible? And I think we see this by where the story goes next. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest heavens, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. 
But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So, when something truly monumental happens, who's the first one to find out? Well, maybe it's national security professionals, maybe it's the politicians, maybe it's the news media. But on this particular day, when arguably the most consequential event in human history to that time occurs, the first people to find out about it, aside from the people who are there, are shepherds. Now, despite shepherds having an outsized influence in Israel's story, after all, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the rest of the patriarchs, and King David were all shepherds, shepherds are not considered polite people. They're considered sort of ruffians and scoundrels in this culture. And so it seems odd to us that God would tell those people first. But I think it's precisely because they're looked down on that God tells them first because Jesus is meant to be a Savior for all. In a world in which there are power imbalances, such as the one we live in, or the one that Jesus is born into, there are certain people who are considered to be worthy, and there are other people who are considered to be less worthy. The worthy people are allowed to enter the space of the unworthy people, but not the other way around. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say, for example, that you are a wealthy businessman. Are you able to get into a soup kitchen? Almost certainly. You might want to leave a Rolex at home, but you would not be asked to leave by people going there. On the other hand, if you're the kind of person who frequents soup kitchens and you went into a high-end shopping center, chances are it wouldn't be very long before the security guards are going to find you and show you the door. So for someone to be truly accessible to all, he needs to inhabit the lowest space because that's the only space that can be universal for everyone. So that's why God picks the stable. No one is too low. No one is too humble to join Jesus in that place. It's like the line in What Child Is This? Come, peasant, king, to own him. The, the king of kings salvation brings let loving hearts and from him. It's not about whether you're a peasant or a king. Jesus' salvation comes to all, and all you have to do is love him. And so God is accessible to all because he makes himself available to the people at the very bottom. Now, what is true of Jesus should also be true of his followers. Jesus incarnates the presence of God. He shows us what God looks like with flesh on. And those who follow him are meant to incarnate Jesus. We're meant to show the world what Jesus looks like with our lives. Jesus, after all, says, As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And while Jesus doesn't restrict access about who can see him, he is subject to the limitations of being flesh and blood. One of those limitations that Jesus accepts in the Incarnation is his inability to be in more than one place at a time. Jesus is local. And so while Jesus would love to minister to everybody simultaneously, he simply can't do that. But when he goes to heaven, and sends the Holy Spirit on all those who receive him by faith, his presence comes to dwell in our lives, and we, as many, can incarnate the presence of God in as many places as we are. And so the church is called to be an explosion of God's incarnate life all over the world. Parts of that involve making God's presence accessible in the lowest and the darkest places. God asked Mary and Joseph to travel to Bethlehem and have a baby in a stable so that God is present with the lowest and the least. And maybe God asks us to also be present to people who are at the bottom end of the spectrum, the people who are often looked down on by other people. Now, it could be that maybe you prefer to be God's incarnate presence with CEOs and movie stars, but the truth is that those people can still find God when he is at the margin. 
We see in the scriptures multiple stories of people who are well to do who still just humble themselves and can approach Jesus even in his lowest state. So, for example, we see the Magi. The Magi, when they arrive, go to the court of King Herod and he receives them, showing that they have status. And yet, even though they are such royal people, when they come, they are able to get an audience with Jesus. We see the story of Zacchaeus, a rich man, who's unable to see Jesus, not because Jesus will see him, but because he's too short. But when he sees Jesus and Jesus sees him, Jesus calls him into fellowship. They have dinner together, and Zacchaeus has a powerful conversion story. And we see the example of Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin, who has questions. And he comes at night to Jesus and asks him those questions, and he humbles himself, saying, you must be from God, because no one who does the things that you do could be from anybody else. So Jesus is still accessible to the rich and famous when he makes himself present among the poor. But he must be present among the poor, among the least, if he is going to be a savior for all, because that's the only universal space, that's the only place where the poor are allowed to be. Now, in the Incarnation, God crosses the boundary from creator to creature. He goes from being apart from the world and to being a part of the world. He adopts us as part of the family, so to speak, by taking on flesh and blood. Now, this church that we have, not our congregation, but the universal church, is God blowing up all the boundaries that normally keep people separate. We are one boundary-breaking family call from every tongue and tribe and nation. But oftentimes, we celebrate Christmas in a way that reinforces our traditional family boundaries. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we can't be with you today because this is family time. In other words, God welcomes us into his family, smashing the boundaries that separate us. And we celebrate by reinforcing those same boundaries. Now, this means that Christmas can be one of the loneliest times for people who don't have strong family ties. I know I, I've experienced this myself. When I was a missionary in Europe, and when I was a student in Belleville, my family lived in Stratford. They were four hours away, and I didn't have a car. I was always alone on those family holidays. Usually they're on Sundays. And so normally I would go to church and then go out for lunch or hang out with some people from church afterwards, but on those days I was never welcome. Oh, I'm sorry, not today. Today is the day for family. And so on those days, days like Mother's Day and Father's Day and Easter and Thanksgiving and Christmas, I found those to be the most isolating time of the year. Now, on the first Christmas, you could say in the sort of way that Mary and Joseph are severed from their family connections. They're in a strange place. They don't have any support. And God comes to be with them in a very unexpected sort of way. Now, we have to ask ourselves, are there Marys and Josephs in our life that we can be incarnate presence of God to? Maybe that involves going to visit somebody in long-term care who doesn't have family to come and visit them during the holiday season. Maybe that means inviting over a neighbor who doesn't have any family for coffee or dessert or dinner. Maybe that involves going to Praise Cafe and having lunch with a stranger, the kind of person that you wouldn't normally see, so that you can do a little bit for them of what God has done for you, making God's hospitality present in bodily form. This might be an inconvenience, although you never know, it might be an unanticipated blessing. But the most faithful way to celebrate Christmas, the Incarnation, is being God's incarnate presence with those who are excluded. So I hope that you have a Merry Christmas. But I also hope that you are able to help others have a Merry Christmas. It's in our power to bless them. So may you have a blessed Christmas and may you be a blessing to others this Christmas. God bless you.